Hi everyone, today we're going to be learning about optical fibers. Optical fibers are a way that we can use total internal reflection uh, in order to transmit light long distances and use it to carry data or information. Now, an, uh, optical fibers are probably the most important use uh, of total internal reflection in our world today. Uh, so they're, they can be used as a sort of waveguide, right? I mean, we have a very, very long pipe within which total internal reflection is occurring, right? So light can pass through this pipe or this waveguide uh, and inside it be reflected as the pipe goes around things like corners, right? The pipe doesn't have to be perfectly straight. It can bend if it likes. Uh, so, it means that we can take a beam of light and using these optical fibers get the light to turn around corners, for example, or carry it over long distances without losing any energy. One of the nice things about total internal reflection is that it is total. We don't get any light loss to refraction. So, how do optical fibers work? Well, we have a number of layers in an optic fiber. Uh, we have a fiber core right in the middle that will be made of something like glass, right? Outside we'll have a cladding. Now the cladding has to have a lower refractive index than the core. Just like if we're going from water into air and getting total internal reflection, it's because the water has a higher refractive index than the air. So in this case, the cladding needs to be like the air in that situation, and the core like the water. And finally, to protect it all, we have a sheath, and the, th the sheath just prevents the inner layers from becoming damaged. Now, when light inside the core gets to the cladding, uh, we'll be going from a high refractive index into a low refractive index, right? And that means that if we do it at the right angle, we will get total internal ref uh, reflection. So it will become totally internally reflected. So the wave of light uh, will propagate through the uh, optical fiber and it will not lose energy, right? None of it will ever become transmitted uh, through the cladding or through the sheath as long as we've got the right angle. Uh, and because we don't lose any energy, we can use it to carry uh, information, or light if you want, long distances without the light getting any dimmer. It's not spreading out. We're, we're just being forced through a single pipe. That means that we don't have to worry about losing energy as we spread out in all directions. Now, the frequency of light, uh, as we know, will depend on the wavelength of light. Right? You can remember that old wave equation. V equals F lambda. We know that the wavelength of light is very, very small. Right? On the scale of a few nanometers. But we know that the velocity of light is very, very high. It's something like 300 million meters per second. This means that the frequency of light is going to be really huge. And uh, this means that it will be much higher than the frequencies that we get by rubbing electrons around if we're sending electrical signals. So what this means is that light can transmit more information per second than electricity can, simply because it vibrates more quickly uh, than electricity, so to speak. And today we use it for high-speed communication because we can transmit lots and lots of data without losing any energy over long distances. So, uh, if we look at what carries things like internet and telecommunications between continents, we usually get things like this. Underwater cables filled with bundles of optical fibers. So these will carry the signals between different continents. They tend to lie along the bottom of the ocean. 
They were first laid down in about the 1980s, which is around the time that optical fiber technology was being developed. And incidentally, also around the time uh, where the internet was starting to be developed. So when these cables are damaged by sharp rocks near the uh, bottom of the ocean, or by the anchor of a ship that happens to be passing by, uh, then it can damage the optical fibers and stop them from transmitting properly. This means that uh, it's possible to get uh, internet moving very, very slowly in entire countries if that country is connected to the rest of the world by a single optical fiber. Uh, there, are, there are, of course, satellites which will uh, reflect or transmit internet signals around. Uh, but they cannot transmit a huge volume of information like these optical fiber cables can. The, uh, the optical fibers can also be used in medicine. Uh, we use them to build things called endoscopes for endoscopy. So an endoscope, as seen here, uh, uses one set of optical fibers in order to shine a light uh, to a particular point at the end of the endoscope. It uses another bundle of optical fibers in order to carry back the reflected light uh, to a scope that a surgeon can see through, right? So we have one optical fiber transmitting light uh, into the cavity in which the endoscope is inserted, and we have another set of optical fibers transmitting light back out so we can actually see what's going on. So why might this be useful? Well, it means that uh, we can do something called keyhole surgery. That means that uh, instead of uh, major surgery, in which, we, in which we might cut someone open so that we can see everything inside them, uh, we only need to cut a very tiny hole. And we can see through this hole and into the person's body by using an endoscope and manipulate it uh, with long tools. And this uh, is much safer than major open surgery. Now, they, uh, optical fibers are, of course, very energy efficient because they don't lose energy due to refraction. However, they can still lose energy. There's no way to get perfect energy transmission. Some of the ways in which optical fibers lose energy are scattering due to defects in the glass. So we might... Uh, move through the molecules of glass in, the slight, in slightly the wrong way and get the light uh, scattering backwards, for example. Uh, we might get light being absorbed by the atoms in the glass and then re-emitted uh, in different directions. We might get uh, transmissions due to defects in the glass. So uh, the, the glass, uh, that is the, the core of the optic fiber, and the cladding might not always be perfectly smooth. And if our transmitted light is to hit a bump, it might start refracting. And finally, transmission due to sharp bends in the cable. If we bend the optic fiber uh, tightly enough, it means that we won't get total internal reflection anymore. Now, we have two different sorts of optical fibers. Uh, one sort is called the multi-mode optical fiber. Now, these tend to be quite wide for optic fibers. Uh, optical fibers tend to be very small. Multi-mode optical fibers are relatively wide at one-tenth of a millimeter. So we're, til we're still talking very small scales here. And what this means is that they can operate at a number of different wavelengths and angles. That is, the light can propagate through them in different modes, hence multi-mode. So data pulses in multi-mode uh, can, in fact, travel at different speeds. And the reason for this becomes apparent if we start to draw what the light pulses look like in a very wide optic fi uh, optical fiber. If here's the top and the bottom, of the optical fiber, then it might be possible for light to be transmitted like this, right? Or like this. Or if we have a, uh, a 
beam of light going almost parallel to the wire, like this, right? Now, the first uh, line that I drew over here is actually moving a much longer distance than the others because it has to go all the way up, all the way down, all the way up, all the way down, instead of just going, for example, straight across, right? That means that the signal uh, has to cover more distance before it reaches the receiving terminal. This means that if we're traveling through a very long optical fiber, then the pulses of data will arrive out of sequence. One uh, pieces of data that you sent first might come out last, instead of coming out first like you would want them to. So if we want to have very long distance transmissions, perhaps intercontinental transmissions, we shouldn't be using multi-mode optical fibers. They just won't do the job. Instead, we can use them for short distance communication. Uh, for example, communication from building to building or communication within a building. If we want to transmit uh, over long distances, then we should be using single mode uh, fibers. In this case, we have a very, very thin optical fiber, and light can only travel one way. That is, it can only travel in a single mode. And so we can't be bouncing off the cladding at uh, all those different angles. So in this case, we can't get quite as much information transmitted, but we can have it all arriving in the sequence that we want it. And so it means that it's hard to corrupt it by moving over very, very long distances. So we can transmit data long distances, but uh, the problem is they're quite expensive to operate. They require the use of very high energy lasers. We can't transmit as much information, so we need to make sure the information goes through as strongly as possible. Otherwise, it might attenuate. Uh, and so data can be transmitted through fibers like these at a rate of about one gigabyte per second, which I'm sure you'll agree is very large. If you were sending all the data on a DVD through an optical fiber, it would take you less than five seconds. Uh, and you can imagine that if you were transferring the contents of a DVD over the internet, for example, not sure why you would, it would be much faster if you were using an optical fiber. So. This is the end of the theory. We've learned a bit about optical fibers, what they're used for, and what different sorts exist. Let's go on to some questions to make sure you've got that all down. Question six. Which of the following is not a use of optical fibers? Is it endoscopic surgery, the transmission of data, the guiding of light waves, or the magnification of images? So we have a few options. Let's go through them. A, endoscopic surgery. Now in an endoscope, uh, we need to have a way of getting light into the cavity and a way of getting light out. Uh, in an endoscope, both of those will be uh, using optical fibers. So optical fibers, in this case, make keyhole surgery possible. Uh, how about the next option? The transmission of data. Now we know that uh, optical fibers can transmit light without losing any energy and they can transmit it over long distances, and we know that it's possible to encode information in light. So uh, optical fibers are in fact very useful for transmitting data long distances. Is it C, the guiding of light waves? Now in both uh, endoscopic surgery and the transmission of data, one of the big advantages of using optical fibers is that we can guide light in whichever direction we want it. So in fact option C relates to both A and to B. So the guiding of light waves is pretty much the reason that we use uh, optical fibers, and so it can't be the right answer. Our last option then is D, the magnification of images. Now remember that when we covered lenses and mirrors, we found uh, forms of each that could be used to magnify an image. Optical fibers, however, uh, aren't used for this purpose. And so D is the correct answer. Uh, images are magnified by lenses or by mirrors. 
not by optical fibers. Question 7. Between which layers of an optical fiber does total internal reflection occur? Is it the core and the cladding, the cladding and the sheath, the sheath and the outside environment, or all of the above? Now I'll give you a clue, it's not all of the above. And the reasons for this will become clear as we go through the other ones. If we were to say C, the sheath and the outside environment, it would mean that the outside environment must have a higher refractive index than the sheath. The problem is we can't guarantee that. I mean, supposing we're embedding an optical fiber inside diamond for whatever reason, diamond has a very, very high refractive index, and so it will be almost possible to get total internal uh, reflection occurring in the sheath. All right, how about the cladding and the sheath? Now, the sheath is a protective layer uh, around the optical fiber, and it doesn't actually have anything to do with the total internal reflection. Uh, we don't need to worry about what its refractive index is. Our last option, if it's not all of the above, is going to be A, the core and the cladding. And this is, in fact, the correct answer. So the core must have a very high refractive index, and the cladding around it must have a very low refractive index. The total internal reflection occurs within the core as light tries to pass from the core into the cladding but is unable to. Question 8. If the refractive index of an optical fiber's core is 1.62 and that of the cladding is 1.52, find the critical angle at the boundary between them. So what do we use here? Snell's law. Uh, what's Snell's law again? It's to do with signs and refractive indices, right? It looks something like this. The sign of the critical angle, or if we really wanted to say it, the sign of the critical angle divided by the sine of 90 degrees equals n2 over n1, right? That's how we define the critical angle. Uh, so all we need to do is substitute in our uh, refractive indices. Taking the inverse sine, we have the inverse sine of 1.52 over 1.62 will equal our critical angle. So evaluating this, we'll end up with an angle of 69.8 degrees. So remember, this is the angle to the normal. If I draw the inside of the optical fiber like this, with the top and the bottom of the optical fiber, then the normal will be perpendicular to that. And so this 70 degrees or so will look like this. So at angles smaller than this, we'll get light refracting and going into the cladding. At angles larger than this, so any light coming in at this angle, for example, will get total internal reflection and no refraction whatsoever. Remember that when we refract, uh, when we get total internal reflection, we're not refracting. The only way that we can get this is if we're moving from a material with a very high refractive index into a material with a low refractive index. For example, water into air. Question 9. Explain why it is essential that the cladding of an optical fiber has a lower refractive index than the fiber. Now I've just mentioned this. So can you still remember the answer? It has to do, of course, uh, with the fact that you can't get a sign of any angle that is greater than 1. You can, however, uh, end up with a sign of an angle that will be less than 1. So for total internal reflection, the cladding must have a refractive index lower than that of the core. And the reason for this is that light trying to move into a higher refractive index will always succeed in refracting. That is, if we're moving light from air into water, there will always be an angle of refraction that's possible. 
and so we can never get total uh, internal reflection. On the other hand, if we're moving from glass into air, or water into air, or glass into water, then there'll be some angle for which there's no possible uh, angle of refraction. And in that case, the light will be totally internally reflected. Finally, question 10. Draw a diagram to illustrate why bending an optical fiber can cause it to lose energy. That is, if we were to take an optical fiber and twist it very, very tightly, we would no longer get total internal reflection. Why not? Well, let's draw a diagram, shall we? Here we have an optical fiber. Right? I've only drawn the core of it. If we were to draw the cladding, then we'd get an extra layer around each edge. Now, let's draw how the light comes into the optical fiber in the straight part. We'll, come, we'll have it coming in at a very large angle, which means that we'll get total internal reflection occurring. Right? There we go. Total internal reflection. The light tries to pass into the cladding, but cannot, uh, because the, it is, it is uh, reaching the boundary between them at an angle larger than the critical angle. But now we get to the bend in the optical fiber. What's going to happen here? Well, uh, at first we'll continue on with our total internal reflection, but then suddenly we're uh, trying to pass into the cladding at a very, very small angle. And this means that instead of getting total internal reflection, we'll simply refract and start bending away from the normal. And so in that case, we'll look like this. We will, of course, get a little bit of reflection happening every time. But more importantly, we're getting refraction happening every time, which means we're losing energy. And because we keep losing energy, and it's always the same proportion of energy lost, the amount of energy left inside the optical fiber gets less and less as we continue to pass through it. So this is because we're getting reflection and refraction and not total internal reflection. Well, that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've uh, covered uh, how total internal reflection is useful to us. We can use it in optical fibers. Optical fibers are used for endoscopes and transmission of data which of course are both quite useful in our world today.